Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you happen to be. Hopefully I've got everybody covered in that. Thank you very much for taking time out to join us again for the next session in Peachtree Business Intelligence. What we're going to be looking at as far as this session is concerned, we're going to be taking a little bit more of a deeper dive into the report manager, some of the things that you can do as far as creating your own reports, adding, deleting, uh, changing columns, filters, and parameters, etc. So we're going to take a little bit more... Uh, a few more steps into the report manager module, how we can start manipulating reports, create some nice pivot table layouts. Uh, so yeah, we'll be taking you on, start building on the skills that uh, we provided for you or we helped provide for you last week. Remember that video is still available for download uh, and will be through the duration of this particular course. We're recording this particular session as well and I'll be uploading it inside of the next 24 hours. My name's Les Allen. Good to have you aboard again. Uh, just to run through a couple of housekeeping points again, uh, just in case we have anybody who wasn't here previously, your screen's going to be updating now. Just a reminder about the GoToWebinar interface that you can click on the orange arrow to collapse that. But more importantly, when it's open, you can click the orange arrow again to open it. More importantly is the questions area. And questions area. If you have any particular questions during the course of the presentation, please type them in, send them through. I'll be able to see all of the questions that come through as they come through. If it's something really poignant uh, and related to what I'm discussing at that point in time, I'll address the question. Otherwise, I'll hold other questions back till the end of the session. All right. So we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. If you do have any other questions, maybe related to the Excel presentations that we did over the last couple of weeks. Uh, everyone will receive an email inside of the next 24 hours with a link to the recorded version. So yeah, that'll happen inside of the next 24 hours. No problems at all. All right, Mark, uh, link for the previous Petri. Actually, Mark, Mark's just sent through that he'd like me to send through the link to the previous Petri video sessions. You know what, Mark, I'm going to do one better. On your screen as it updates, you'll actually see that link. Uh, all of the videos that we post, community.alchemex.com uh, forward slash group. Now, there's forward slash Alchemex webinars, but the actual group for Peachtree Business Intelligence will actually be Sage Peachtree Intelligence. Uh, and I'll give that link at the end of the session. So, Mark, if you don't catch it then, I will send it through to you. Uh, not a problem via email. All right. So, again, as I said, the video is recorded for the last session and you're free to download it. That's the recommended way of viewing it. All right. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, uh, no problems at all, Mark. Mark just sent a thank you in. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Agenda, what are we going to talk about today? The layout of the report manager module. So last session we looked at taking a report, scheduling it, running it. Uh, sorry, we didn't talk about scheduling. Sorry, that's a, a bit more of an advanced option. Taking a report, running it out, and then doing some basic customizations. We looked at it might, might actually be possible uh, to update a report, but what we're going to be doing now is taking data that comes out of our Peachtree database and start manipulating it a bit further. Okay, so manipulating data, data layouts in pivot tables in Excel. Then we'll take a look at how to import and export reports. This is a very important point as far as business partners are concerned because some customers may just want you to write a report and sell it to them. You have the technical knowledge of the tables in the back end of Peachtree. You'll know exactly how to get the data. You'll know best what's happening in this module so you can start customizing it. You can then give it to a customer. You can give it to multiple customers, and that's actually an important point. So when I get to import exports, we'll take a look at how we can do that then what a customer needs to know as far as bringing that report in and the ramifications for business partners as far as revenue streams are concerned. Then we're going to move back to the financial report. We took a look at the financial report last week and from the financial report we can look at the add accounts function. Last week we talked about the idea that every particular report has a template attached. Now we're going to be updating these particular templates with changes that we would like to make. One of those changes could be that the next time we run the report, we've got some new accounts coming in to our financial layouts. How do I save those reports so I don't need to add them each and every time? And how do I bring them in in the first place? That's what we'll be talking about there. 
talk about the license manager, and then we'll give you a brief overview of what's to come in level two. All right. Again, any questions that uh, you may have during the course of the presentation, please feel free to send them through, and let's kick off. So, layout of the report manager module. Let me switch into the report manager interface for PBI 20, uh, 2012. <laughs> Right. Oh, also, actually, good point that I bring that up. An email was sent around to business partners, giving them the opportunity to download the beta version of 2012 so that you can start using uh, Peachtree Business Intelligence. If anybody does not have that email, please let me know via the questions window, and I'll make sure you get access to the link to download that beta. All right. So any questions along those lines, please send them through, through to me and I'll address them at the end of the presentation. I'll get you the information that you need. Right. So what are we looking at here as far as the report manager screen is concerned? Well, first thing I'm going to draw your attention to is the menus. All right. Uh, got one in relation to the beta. Not a problem. I'll handle that at the end of the session. So what we're looking at at the top is the toolbars. But one thing about the toolbars is that you don't necessarily need to know everything that is there because most things, pretty much everything in Peachtree Business Intelligence that can be done from the toolbar, you can do via a right-click method. So depending on what object you've selected, now see over on the left-hand side you've got your object window, very much like a Windows Explorer interface. At the very top we have Home, then we have our folders underneath, and inside those folders we then have specific reports and you can select on any of the reports and then right click on those. The menus are contextual. All right. So the options that you will get via right clicking or via the menu will change depending on what you've selected. Let's start out just briefly right clicking on home. Now we're only going to have a look at this particular right click menu. There's a couple of options that we will go through uh, that we will go through with you during further sessions along. We can add folders, we can refresh folders, we can unlock Excel, we can see hidden reports. That's something that we'll talk about when we talk about creation of union reports. Show hidden reports, show system variables, etc. But if I was to right click on a report, I then have a number of different options. So the same thing will happen depending on what you've selected in the object window. The toolbars that you have across the top, they will then change. Okay, so it's the first thing to note, but very much like a Windows Explorer interface, your object window is on the left, the properties will then be on the right. So let me take a look at this financial reports designer report. Okay, so I've selected the report, and you can see across on the right hand side that I now have properties for this particular report. So I can see the report ID number. Any of the fields that you see in blue cannot be changed. With the exception of the report template, we can use the Browse button. You'll see that last field, that last blue field report template on the right-hand side. At the very end, there's a Browse button, three dots and ellipsis. That's your Browse button, and you can go and select a different template, but you won't be able to type any changes into those particular fields. Now, it's an important thing to understand about the report ID number is that by having a look at the ID number, you'll be able to see exactly what report you're actually looking at. All of the reports inside of Petri Business Intelligence use an ID number, and it uses a unique ID number. When we talk about importing, exporting, that's going to come, kind of going to come in to play on a couple of occasions because I could import a report that has a name exactly like a report I already have. That's going to be a common thing, but you'll be able to identify which is the later report by looking at the report ID number itself. It's unique and it's incremental. If I create another report, that report will now be ID number 14, for example. Report name and description, pretty self-explanatory. Report name, you can name the report anything you like. As I said, even naming it the same thing as another report in your report manager interface. But here is a very, very good field, and it's, it's a good thing to, as you're creating reports to get into practice using this particular field. I've just clicked into the description field, and you'll see I'm just highlighting that there's a lot of text in there. 
if you're going to move forward with creating reports, even on the odd occasion for customers, maybe it's not something you'll be doing full time, but you will be creating the odd report. For those of you who have ever done any programming at school or in college, any formal programming lessons, one of the first things you get told is to comment your code. Please put comments into your code so you know later when you come back exactly what this thing is supposed to be doing. So here's a good idea with the description as well. So my financial reports designer, here's a description and it says, this report is a designer enabled report that allows you to access report designer functionality to generate financial reports. Each of the reports has a description. When you create a report, if you're customizing it for a specific customer, it might be a good idea for you to put in the details about what sort of customizations you did. It's always a good thing, so when you come back later, you'll remember, you see another customer, I did a report for Bellwether. I know I did a report for Bellwether and it's looking kind of like what this company might need. Let me go back and find it. Now, you might have written five or six reports for Bellwether. Knowing which one was which, the description can help. The template storage location, that is where all of the template files that will be attached to the report will be stored. Okay. They'll all be saved to a templates folder and it's a very good idea to add that location to any backup procedure. Actually the PTXA folder, you'll see that it finishes off in the templates folder. I would go back one level, the PTXA folder, I would make sure that that file pathing down to that folder is added to your backups. The reason being, something happens, these files are sitting outside of your Peachtree database itself, so they're not going to be saved as part of a normal backup procedure. However, if you add that to any backup systems that the customer might be having, in the event that the machine crashes, stolen, fire, wrath of God, anything that might happen to the machine, you can restore all of the reports if you have those folders in a backup process. And of course, the report template itself, that's the name of the report, and parameters on the second sheet. We're going to talk, we talked about last week the layout of a report itself, where we would actually put different parts of, uh, different parts of a report as that data runs out. Parameters on section sheet is an optional, uh, is an optional field, but during the course of the training, we could talk about the parameters themselves and why they should be used, why they're useful as far as reports go. All right. So the layout, the report manager module, now we're going to start moving through the tabs themselves. So what I'm going to do is very quickly, I'm not going to really wait for uh, screens to update, but I'm going to very quickly create a report and you'll be able to review all of my steps on the video when you download the video. I'm going to create a standard report and I'm going to call it my sales report. Very imaginative, I know. I understand and I apologize. I'm going to be using the normal sales analysis container that's readily available so any customer or yourself can do this. Selecting sales analysis. Question came through from, let me just open up so I can actually see them. And let me close off my Outlook. That would actually help as well. Diane sent through the question, what is a union report? A union report, we'll go through the creation of union reports later, but briefly, a union report is where you combine multiple reports together to create one consolidated report. Now, when I say multiple reports, I mean of different types. I can create a sales report, and then I can create a stock report. With a union report, I can combine both of those reports into one Excel file, so now I'm looking at a consolidated view of my sales and my stock. All right, I hope that clarifies things, but we will be going through the creation of union reports at a later point. So give me my customer account number, uh, my customer name, the date of the sale, the item description, And let me have a look at my total invoice paid. So it's basic information, all right? Not doing anything great. And as I said, if you check the video, you'll be able to see every mouse click that I actually make. All right. So my sales report, 
I've now created a report, but the reason I've created it is so I can start taking you through the fields and the columns over on the property site. So we looked at the properties tab. The next tab is columns. Now you saw when I when I created my report from scratch that I asked for certain fields. If I select columns, I can now see what pieces of information I'm bringing through into this report. From any of the standard reports, once you make a copy of them and unlock them, you'll then be able to see all of the pieces of information that are designed to bring through into the report itself. And they're going to go to the very first sheet of the workbook. It's something that I'm going to repeat a few times during the training sessions when we're talking about running reports out, is that all of the raw data that's coming from Petra, everything that you've selected, will go to the first workbook, uh, first worksheet in the workbook. Please get out of the habit at this point of saying sheet one. The reason I say that is because the first sheet in the workbook may not be called sheet one. You can rename sheets pretty much anything as long as you're, uh, limit, you're only limited by special characters, certain special characters, and the number of characters you can actually put into the sheet name. So I can rename that sheet. It doesn't have to be sheet one, but it will always be the first sheet in the workbook that will receive my data. So those are the columns that I've selected. You can see them there. Customer account number, customer name, date, item description, and total invoice paid. If I was to look at that information, date would probably be, be the first thing that I would want to see on my report. By date, then by, cust by account number, then by customer name, then by the product that they bought, then the total amount. So what can you do here? If I select the date field, you'll see over on the right hand side that I now have move up, move down, or remove fields available for me to select. Pretty self-explanatory. I could also remove a field by pressing delete, but you also see that I've got the option to add a field. So even if you're not sure about the options the first time you select the fields, you can always come back to the columns tab and add more information. If I select add, you'll see my column, choose column fields comes up again and I can go through and select. Now, some people might say, well, I see that company account number, a customer account number is there and is an option to select again. There is a very good reason why we might want to bring the same information in a couple of times, particularly in relation to things like total invoice paid. But we'll talk about that when we get to level two, when we start talking about aggregations. Okay. Aggregations is where I can start totaling information, but I can choose the way that I'd like to aggregate it by sum, by count, etc. So there are some reasons why you might want to bring the same field in a couple of times, but we'll talk about that in the later session. For now, it's just to show you that even if you don't quite get everything to start, you can still come back in later and add the fields that you choose. What I'm going to do now is also drag and drop the date field. I'm going to drag it up, select it, drag it up, and drop it on top of customer account number to change the order. Your screens will update, so you may not have seen that in real time. Again, I'll direct you to the video that you'll be able to download. So there's date, there's customer account number, customer name, item description, and total invoice paid. All right. Let me take a look at that particular report, and I'm going to run that information directly out into Excel. We haven't put any limitations on what data we would like to see, so everything that exists in my Bellwether database, according to date, the customer account, the customer name, from my sales, all of that information is going to come through. So let me select the report. I can right click to run the report, or I can press the green play button from my menu button. The report will then load and export directly into Excel. Okay, so when your screen updates, you'll see that I've got some raw information. Okay, how much information do I have? I'll be able to show you that very quickly in just a second. But there we've got our date, the customer account number, the customer name, item description, and the total invoice paid. 
keyboard shortcut for Excel on any particular cell, especially if you're in a table, if you press control arrow down, it will take you to the last row in that particular table. So the last field, oh sorry, it'll take you to the last field that has text in it. So if there is a column in here, like you'll see in column D that there may be some cells that are empty, control arrow down will take you to the last cell with text in it in that column. By doing it on date, there's always a date there. I've brought myself all the way down to row 955, and you can see that I do have some descriptions in my item description column. All right. So now this is just a basic report showing you exactly what information we can start bringing through, how we select the columns, and how we can start moving this information around. How you lay out the information in the columns tab, that's exactly how it will land as far as our report is concerned. Now we're going to, a little bit later, talk about creating a pivot table where we can start reorganizing the data and make it much easier to read. And some people might say, well, if I'm reorganizing the data in another form that makes it easy to read, who cares what order these things hit this sheet in? Now, ta sorry, um, Tammy, I just see your question come through. Let me finish off on my point here. So we're looking at this raw data, and we can determine which way our columns are going to be landing. But then why do it if we need a pivot table? The answer is, if you need to double check any of the information that's being expressed in the pivot table to check if all of the information is correct, then coming back and seeing this raw data sheet in an orderly form, then I can say, oh, great. It makes it much easier for me to read because I've got a logical progression of my details. Okay, so my date, my customer account, my customer name, item number, and total invoice paid. Now Tammy sent through, how do you weed out the duplication that you see in the Excel workbook? Okay, well now it depends on what you mean by this duplication. I can see that there are a number of rows that have been repeated, but why have they been repeated? So we would need to look at exactly what's happened as far as these transactions are concerned. But if we've really identified that there is certain information I do not want to see, then we need to start looking at our filters and our parameters. So filters and parameters, so Tammy, I actually have to thank you because you provided a very good lead into the next point. Filters and parameters are things that you can set up in the report manager module that limit the information coming through. Jason sent through a note, just a quick bit of info, uh, the bizint folder is included in the Peachtree backup file. Excellent, thank you very much for that feedback, Jason. All right, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to close off this file and it's a good idea when you're doing report writing and report generation to close off files that you really don't need. Having too many Excel files open is obviously going to have an impact on your machine's performance, but it also helps you not get confused as to what you're working on right now. So let me move back to my report manager, and now I'm going to look at filters. Okay, actually, let me first move on to parameters because there are, the parameters effect is very easy to see right up front. Okay, so filters and parameters here. These are ways to restrict the information that is coming into the report. For those people who know SQL, it's like adding where clauses to your SQL query. Right. So from the parameters side, let me add a parameter. Okay, I've clicked on add, box comes up says, choose a filter field. So here's an important point. All of the fields that I chose for my report, them and more are represented in this box. In fact, this filter fields box is giving me access to everything that is available in that container. So I can filter on things that don't even have to be represented in the report. As long as that information is available in the container, I can still filter on it. So let me do a very basic one. A very basic one on customer name. Okay, so customer name, I'm going to select the field and click OK. So now we're talking about comparison methods. Okay, I'm looking at my customer, but what do I want to, how do I want to filter? Do I want to say equal to a specific report? 
less than a particular value, greater than a particular value. Maybe we're talking about document types. Okay. These are your comparison methods. Now, some of them would be very, very easy to spot. Some will be very easy to spot, equal to, greater than, less than, you'll know exactly how to use them. And there's a number of ways you can use these particular comparison methods. But one in particular that I'd like you to look at is the is in option. Okay. Uh, Mary sent through, isn't this like crystal reports? Well, Mary, it, it's pretty much, yeah, it's very, it's very similar to how you start setting up reports in crystal. If you've got crystal reports knowledge, it's a very, very easy port to come across to a product like Peachtree Business Intelligence. You can even bring the queries across that you've written in Crystal and put them in your own containers, so it's very, very easy. Okay, uh, Tammy sent through, I know this is going to sound basic, but you can please explain the definition of a container. If you think a container is very much like a query, okay, a container is going to let, we're going to go into containers in more detail later on in the training sessions, but a container briefly says, what information do you get to play with? So if you write a table join where you want to combine customer details with sales details, that would be a join. That's a container. So the container will then say, this is what information you have to play with. So when I added a report, you'll see in the video that there were a number of containers I could have chosen. Some provided financial information, some provided sales, some provided stock. These containers are effectively your own joins that can say what information, what tables, and what fields you'd like to play with. So every report, every standard report uses a container because the report needs to know what information do I get to play with. In this instance, I've chosen the sales analysis container. Now I'm playing with all of the information that container gives me. I hope that helps clarify things for you, Tammy. All right. My comparison methods, I'm not going to start with equals, greater than, less than. You guys should be pretty okay with those concepts. Is in, though, is very, very powerful, and I want to demonstrate this right off the bat. If I said to you that I wanted my report to equal customer X, I would only get transactions for customer X. But what if I wanted customer A, customer Q, and customer X? Now, I couldn't very well use a greater than or a less than, because it'll look alphabetically, and there might be other customers in those particular ranges. Using the is in option will have an effect. I'm going to come back to my optional default parameters in a second. For now, I'm just going to leave it blank. The optional default, when I try to run the report now, you'll see that a pop-up window comes up. Okay. Let me select the report and run it. I now get a pop-up window asking me what customer would I like to look at. And I'm going to let everybody's screens update now. You should actually be seeing it on your screen now. There's my customer with a blank field, but a browse button over on the right-hand side. When I click browse, you'll now see that I have a list of all of the customers, but all of my customers have a tick box. So I can now choose which particular customers I would like to see. So this helps get around the greater than, less than ranges that you might have to select. But also, if you used equal to, you would browse, you would get to select one customer because it is equal to that customer name. But is in is an ability that lets you choose multiple values for a parameter or for a filter. So it's a good point to it's a good thing to demonstrate at this point. So let me just select uh, five five customers at random. Now I click OK, the report will execute and only bring through those particular values. Okay. Thing about parameters, you can have multiple parameters. Now that report ran very, very quickly. I only asked for five of the customers. They mustn't have done a lot. There we go. All right. So when your screen updates, you'll see that it's now just a combination of those five customers. Again, when you review the video, you can pause it and see which customers I selected, so you can then compare this against our output file. Parameters will start limiting, but they give you the choice at runtime to change the values that are going to be filtered on. So next time I run this report, I could select five completely different customers. It's entirely up to me. 
the important thing to understand is that a parameter will let you choose the value that you want to filter on at runtime. All right. One thing I will ask you to note is some of the, the values that are here. I've got a lot of transactions, invoice paid of zero, etc. Now, maybe I only want to look at certain values. Give me all invoices of a certain amount or less than a certain amount, etc. Let's now take a look at what else we can do as far as this report is concerned with a filter. So I'm going to close off my report. I'm moving back to my report manager. And to wrap up a point, you can add multiple parameters. So please show me only these dates and only these customers and only these products. So you can stack multiple parameters down. What I'm going to do now is move to the filters page. Okay, Filters and parameters work exactly the same way, as in they do exactly the same thing. They will limit information that comes through. This time though, I'm going to say my total invoice paid amount only show me, so I've highlighted total invoice paid amount, your screens have updated now, I click OK, but now I only want to see everything less than or equal to zero. I want to see those negative values. So again, your comparison method, you could use this in any way. The important difference will be, I'm selecting less than or equal to, my comparison value, you saw when I did my parameter that I left that comparison value blank. So when the pop-up screen came up, there was no information in it, but I could then choose the value. A comparison value, that's something that's going to be used automatically when it comes to a filter. So I'm going to say zero and click OK. So now I have a filter set up and I have a parameter set up. When I run my report, you'll see that only one of those comes up and asks me for information. So when your screen updates now, it should have now, you'll see I have the option to choose my customers, but I don't have any option to choose the filter amount. And that's the key difference. They do the same thing, but a filter will let you, will not let you at runtime choose the value. If a filter is there, the filter is set, and you have no option to change the value that is being used. A parameter, a parameter can give you the opportunity to change those values at runtime. Now I'm going to really try and I'm going to have to select five different ones. There we go. I think they might have been the same five. Can you use a parameter in a filter? Uh, Tammy, well, no, a parameter is completely separate to a filter. They both do the same things and they, they let you filter on a value. It's just the parameter will let you change that value when the report runs. A filter will not let you change the value that you're going to be filtering on. Notice that I said that a parameter does do a filter. Parameters filter information. It's just the value. What value would you like to use? If it's always going to be the same thing, if it's always going to be set like for the same day or for the same sales rep or for the same customer, if those things are never going to change, set them up as filters. The user or you don't even have to worry when you run the report. You don't even have to worry about that. It's been set as a filter. You know that's going to take effect. But if you'd like to change the date range, leave the sales rep as a filter, but set the date range as a parameter. What I'm going to do is cancel the report because now I'm going to look at adding an additional one. Okay, so uh, Mary's just sent through, so you would use a filter when you don't want anybody to change it. Absolutely. If you know that's the value that this report must conform to, set it as a filter. Tammy sent through, for example, you could use a parameter to ask for a profit margin, only select invoices that Absolutely. The value could change each time, each time the report is run on like gross profit margins of a report. Yes. If you want to change the value that you're searching for, you would set it as a parameter. You wouldn't set it as a filter. You can then choose the percentage value that you would like to run on, and then the report would run. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at adding additional parameter. Actually, let me make sure I'm on the parameters tab first before I add it. So now I add it. This time I'm going to run it on date. So this time when the report runs, I just want it to run for everything from today's date 
onwards. Okay, so I click OK. My comparison method will be greater to greater than or equal to. I click OK. Now I can enter a default value at this point. So by pressing on the three dots, the browse button, it brings up my calendar. It will so if you're filtering on dates. If you're filtering on anything else like customer's name, what happens is that browse will go back to the database and bring you all of the all of the values available for you to filter on. So you can have a parameter that preps the customer. It gives it the option, gives the customer the option of using these values, but they can still change them if they wish to. So let me use my end of month as my value. I click OK. And now I have a second parameter. Let me run the report out. Frederick, I've seen your question that's just come through. Let me run the report out so the screen can update and then I can address it. Are there parameters or filters for today, this week, automatically without typing in the date? Frederick, yes they are. There are, but we'll be covering that in another session. All right. Free sent through the glossary is in the student curriculum we were sent last time in lesson one, page seven, and it has free. You're fantastic. Thank you very much. I Actually, I feel like a school teacher wanting to give out gold stars. This is fantastic. Free. Uh, Tammy, Free's just mentioned that if you have a look at the student curriculum, page one, lesson seven, it gives you the definition of containers if mine wasn't succinct. All right. If I can draw your attention to the screen, though, customer name. Customer name was empty. I didn't have anything as far as the optional parameter was concerned. Default parameter, sorry. But date, see how it came in? 31 March. 2011. So that's where setting up the option, uh, the default parameter is going to come into play. All right. So I'm not going to run the report out. I've kind of I've, I think I've demonstrated parameters and filters. The the main thing for you to understand though is filters. You don't get to change the value at runtime. Parameters that you, parameters you do. Okay. Mary said, but you can change the date format. Uh, Mary, I, if by changing the date format you mean 31st or 3 slash 31 slash 11, if that's what you're looking at, don't believe so. Let me test it. So we're talking 03 dash 31 dash 11, and I'm just going to run it for a couple of customers. I'll select all and click OK. Let's see if the default, yeah, there is no data for this report because it needs the date information in the format as it displays. So if you use the calendar and select the date, it'll be date, full name of the month, then the year. So no, you won't be able to change the date, uh, the date format. All right. Lisa, uh, Lisa sent through the date format is controlled by Windows settings. It's a bit different here when it comes to databases, Lisa, in that Certain databases will want to see date information in certain ways. So in the back end of Petri Business Intelligence, we handle that process automatically. We just ask that the date be given date, full month, then the year. Then we'll be able to handle exactly how it works as far as that particular database is concerned. Is concerned. All right. Fred sent through. It looks like the selected tab is elevated about one sixteenth of an inch over the other tabs. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, well, Fred, you'll be able to see where which tab is selected because the tab itself will have a dotted line around it. All right. So Mary, yep, yeah, unfortunately there is no way to change the date format because that's how it needs to be accepted in order to be able to communicate with the databases effectively. Databases pervasive. Pervasive needs dates in a certain format. Microsoft SQL needs dates in a different format, but we don't want to have to burden users with how to do those particular things. So we handle the date process for you. We just ask you to put it in that method so we know what we're handling so we can then pass it to the databases. All right. The sort fields tab. You go into Excel, you have a table of information, you want to sort it by a particular column. So in this instance, I'd probably want to sort my report by date. So I can add a sort field in from my container. Okay, Mary, yes, you can change it in Excel. So you'll notice that when, I, even though I put my format in as 31st of March 2011, when the data landed in Excel, uh, 
the date format had slashes. So it was day, month, year as far as slash slash format was concerned. You can indeed change that once you get it into Excel. It's just for input purposes that we need consistency. All right. Hope that answers the question. Let me put a sort field down on date. All right, so I've selected date. I'm going to click OK. Now you can see when your screen updates, the date field is there with an arrow pointing up. You can select date and then choose over on the right hand side to make it ascending or descending. So it's going to sort the data as it lands in Excel. All right, very simple. Again, you can add multiple sort fields, just like you can add multiple filters and multiple parameters. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my date parameter because now I need to quickly move into pivot tables. Running out my report, I would like to see all of my information as far as my filters are concerned. I only want to see all values where there's a negative value, but I want to run this report for all of my customers. So let me run the report. And I'm going to get that raw information and take it into Excel. And when it's there, I'm going to create a pivot table around that raw data table. So for all of my customers, that's fine. Okay. Still brought through some raw, some zero data. So I'm going to have to check my parameters, but I can do that later. Now I want to talk about pivot tables. So here is my raw data table. Pivot tables are a standard function available from Excel 2003 onwards. However, with 2007 and 2010, you do get a couple of extra functions that weren't available in 2003 formats. So I would encourage you to encourage your customers to look at upgrading to Excel 2010. They can't upgrade to 2007 anymore because it's just simply not available for sale. They can move to 2010 though. There are a couple of reasons why you would want to do that and we'll be covering them in other sessions, but for now I want you to have a look at the insert tab on my ribbon when your screen updates and you'll see that I've highlighted the very first icon there, pivot table. Pivot tables are very powerful, it allows you to drag and drop information around looking at the same information in different ways. So let me press pivot table and here is a key point that I need to talk about. It's in relation to data ranges. Okay, and named ranges. All right. By having any cell in this table selected, the pivot table is saying, sure, I'll make a table based off this information. You can see that it's actually highlighting the entire table. Select a table or range. Now, at the moment, it's looking at cells A1 through to E877. That's a problem for me next time I run the report because maybe there might be more than 877 rows of data the pivot table will not automatically update. You've told it. Those are the cells that I want to look at. But we give you a named range. If I press F3, F3 lists all of the named ranges in this report, and we'll be covering named ranges as well later on in other Excel presentations. The raw data named range, all of the data that lands in your sheet will always be called raw data, whether it's 10 rows or 10,000. So by telling the pivot table always look at raw data, it'll always be up to date. Your pivot table report will always be up to date. Now, in order to bring up that box, I pressed F3. F3 will work throughout Excel bringing up your named range box. So if you do use named ranges, it's a very good shortcut to know. So instead of looking at A1 through to E877, now I'm looking at sheet one raw data. Next option, new worksheet or existing worksheet. I'm going to select new worksheet, but please watch where that sheet lands. When I click OK, have a look at the sheet order. And in particular, I'm looking at the very first sheet in this workbook. The thing that I mentioned earlier is that all raw data, when a report runs, must run to the first sheet in the workbook. So right now, this is bad. If you select a new worksheet, you must ensure to drag it past at least the second sheet. The first sheet will always be for the raw data. The second sheet 
carries your parameters. So let me drag Sheep4 across past my first and second sheets. Doesn't really matter where it goes after that point. But now what I'd like to do is bring through just a basic pivot table. I'm going to make my customer name, my row labels. If your screens are not updating fast enough to see what I'm dragging and dropping, please check download and check the video. You'll be able to see everything that I'm doing there. Let me bring through my total invoice paid and then my item description directly under the customer name. So when you screen updates, you'll see that I've now got a very nice table that's reorganized that raw data into a much more readable format. There's the customer's name, there's the products that the customer's bought, and the amounts. So pivot tables, we have got video presentations on pivot tables that you're able to download from the website. So now I can drag this information around. Instead of seeing it by customer name, maybe I'd like to see it by date of sale. So let me drag item description up and bring date down in front of my customer name. When your screen updates, you'll now see that everything's been reorganized in date order. So just by changing the fields, that, fields around that come out of my report, I can start seeing my information in different ways. Now that didn't take very long, that only took me about 30 seconds to create a pivot table, drag some fields down, and now I've got a report. I can go back and I can create and link this report to my, uh, this template to my report in Report Manager, and that's the way that it's going to be seen each and every time. So there's a number of ways you can re-look at data as far as reports are concerned. You can add parameters which change the filter value each time. You can have set filters, which the end user, the person running the report, won't be able to change. But even once you get that information in, you can do further analysis once it's in here by creating a pivot table. That didn't take a lot of work at all. And customers will enjoy being able to drag the information around, filter the information, and be able to represent it in different ways so they can get different dimensions on their business information. Right. But as I said, we do have presentations, video presentations, uh, free, are you talking about, oh, free, I just closed off the, are you talking about relinking the template free? Free's just asked, can you please show it, show how I do it in Report Manager, I just need to clarify what it is. I think Free's talking about creating the template. Okay, I'll do that very quickly, select all, so I'm not going to wait for screens to update, I just need to recreate this report quickly, and then go through the create and link process. F3, I want my raw data there. As I said, you'll be able to check everything out on the video that I'm doing. There's the customer name, there's the date of sale, and there's the total invoice paid. All right, so I'm going to let everybody's screens update now, so you can see the report that I've just created. That's how quick it took me. It took me 10 seconds to do a pivot table around the raw data. So I'm going to move back to Report Manager. I'm going to right-click on my sales report. Okay, I'm going to use the Create and Link Template option. Create and Link Template says, which workbook is currently open, which one do you want to use for your report each and every time? So I select it, that's my book four. I click OK. There's a couple of parameters that I need to run through, like you've got parameters coming onto your second sheet. I need to clear that now. Is that OK? Yes, it is, because I want you to run through nicely next time you run the report. What type of format would you like to give it? This will only happen if you have 2007 or 2010 on your machine, but you can create reports for the 97-2003 file type. I'm going to make it a 2007 template. Give the template a name. Screens are updating now. There we go. By default, it'll be named the same template name as my report is. And my last question, and this will only happen once, when you have a pivot table in your report. It will give you the option to turn off the pivot table saving data, which is a good thing. I want that turned off because there's no need for my pivot table to save data as far as the template is concerned. I need it to be fresh each and every time. So I say yes to this. When you check out the video, what's going to happen is it will swing back to Excel and clear out all of the raw data 
but it will leave the structure. I now have my message, template created and linked successfully. So that entire process of creating, well, not a really nice sales report, but a sales report nonetheless, I could have got that done in less than three minutes. Adding the report, choosing the fields, applying my filters parameters, running the report out, creating a pivot table, create and link template, around about five minutes. Okay, a couple of things that I now need to run through because we're, we're running short of time in this presentation. Import export reports. Now that I've created my report, I'm going to right click on my report and I'm going to export it. I'm going to select the export report option. What this will do is it will take all of the components necessary to create my report, and my X3 has just uh, decided to step in. It will take all of the components of the report and put it into one file, all of the components of the report. So the container this report is using, the template and the report itself, they all get wrapped in this file so that when you send it to somebody, they can then import it and the report will work for them. It's a very simple process. You simply right click on a report and export it. You can then save it. You'll see that the file extension is .al underscore. I can save it to any particular location and it's a good thing if you're going to start getting into report writing to occasionally export your reports so that you can keep backups of them. So export your report, maybe put it to an optical drive, put it onto a CD, burn it on the CD and back it up, uh, off-site data storage, etc. I'm going to save it straight to my desktop. I get a very nice message telling me it has been exported. Now, you've created a report for a customer. You've created it just like we did there. I've now exported it. I add that file as an attachment to the email and send it to the customer. Customer then calls me and says, well, what do I need to do now? Okay. They, you get them to right click on the folder and select import report. They'll then be asked to identify what file they want to import. So they would have saved it off their report as an attachment onto their desktop. They select the file and when they click open, they really only have two options. What name would you like to give the report? Now at this point, I'm going to say it's my new sales report. So they can rename the report at this time. The target connection, we'll talk about connections in level two, but the connection that they'll get as standard is their auto connect. What this means is this report will, will run on the company they're currently logged into. All right. Will it override if it's the same name? Jennifer, no it won't because it uses the ID number. If it's the next report to come in, it will have the next ID number in an incremental fashion. The only impact it may have is that if you already have a report called My Sales Report, but there's a template called My Sales Report, this report will try and come in with My Sales Report and it will ask, do you wish to override it or do you wish to give it a new name? That's the only ramification, but as far as the report is concerned, no it won't. So import my connection and my, to my target connection of auto connect. The screen that comes up now, remember that everything needed to make the report work goes with this export. That includes the container that the report is using. I've now imported it back into the same system and I've got a message here saying, hang on, I've got a container by that name. Now you can use that container or if you click no, I'll bring the new container in. So again, these two containers will have the same name, but because they've got different ID numbers, they'll be able to live in harmony. So I'm going to say yes, I haven't made any major changes to my container, it's just using the same thing. And there we go. It's a very simple process to export a report. Very, very easy to do. So it's very easy for you to start creating reports at home, at the office, take a report, customize it, export it, and email it to the customer. Of course, once you get a proof of payment for the report itself, but you can email it to the customer and they can import it. The entire process can be managed very quickly. Tammy sent through, if you send a client a report that contains a custom container that you created on your end, when they import, 
can they then import the custom container? Absolutely. That message that I showed you, if you clicked yes, it would then that report would attach itself to the container that exists. But if you say no, it will bring through your custom container and that'll be imported and sit alongside the original container. So yep, yeah, there will be no problems as far as containers are concerned. Okay. Moving along very quickly. Let me run through my financial reports because now I need to show you the, let me take 2011 data and let me have a look at my budget information. In the financial reports, we're given a very neat functionality as far as the report runs. Remember that when the create and link template process, how you set up, oh, okay, Brad, sorry, Brad's just sent through a very good question. I don't see my new sales report on the menu. Why is that? All I need to do, Brad, and I'm just letting the screens update now, I'm going to double click on the sales folder and double click again to refresh the folder. You'll now see it there. But well spotted. Thanks very much for the reminder, Brad. Okay. My income statement, generating the layout, etc. Remember that when we do the create and link template process, the create and template process saves the structure of the report. The raw data will update each and every time. So right now, I'm going to let everybody's screens update. You can see that I've just run out the one of the income statement layouts from the financial report. Okay. As far as the financial report is concerned, this is what I want to see. I can start deleting columns. I can start deleting rows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I then create and link, my structure will stay. But maybe the next time I run the report, new accounts have been added into Peachtree. If new accounts have been added into Peachtree, they'll come through to this report and I'll be prompted with a very nice message. If you check out your notes that were sent through a couple of hours ago, you'll be able to see that you'll get a message saying, I have detected new accounts. Would you like to add them to the report? They'll be added to the report, but they won't be added to your specific layouts. The reason they won't be added to your specific layouts is your layouts are specific. You set them up that way. We're not going to just jump in and start tampering with the layouts that you've created, but we will give you the option to add them very, very quickly. Let me say that I'm deleting that particular range of accounts. So I press Control minus, those accounts are now gone. And maybe I'll make, yeah, let's make them, a fair few of them gone. Okay. So these are the reports that I would, these are the accounts I would like to see on this layout. I create and link my template. This is how my sheet will stay. But we mentioned previously that you now have an add-ins tool that gives you extra functionality as far as these reports are concerned. From the add-ins tool, it'll automatically be added to your Excel, whichever version, once you've installed Peachtree Business Intelligence, and from the Report Tools option, you now have the ability to add accounts. Okay, so selecting the Add Accounts, it will ask you what type of accounts would you like to bring in? Were they balance sheet or income statement accounts, etc.? I'm just going to leave mine as all. It will identify any accounts on this sheet that aren't there. It will look at all the raw data that comes through with all of those accounts, check this sheet, and give you a list of all of the accounts. Let me just take my income statement accounts, and you'll see when your screen updates, by selecting income statement accounts, there are all of the accounts that I deleted off my layout. Now, I deleted them because I haven't added any new reports since I last, uh, accounts since I last added this report. I select income statement. I can select as many or as few of these as I want to. And then I can insert. Well, I inserted at the wrong row, so let me delete that again. Okay, let me get this right here. Okay, there's my ad accounts. Okay, you'll see my insert at row. Insert row at 13, that's excellent. All of my income statement accounts, I want to bring those ones in. 
and then I click my insert option. And very quickly, it inserts those particular accounts and those particular accounts only at that point. So if you've started customizing income statements, started customizing balance sheet reports, you can always easily update them. Now that I've brought in those accounts, I can still choose whether I want to do anything extra to them. The most important point though, is once this is done, create and link the template. Otherwise, the changes that you've made will need to be redone next time because the original template won't have those changes made. Right. But that is also covered in all of your notes. Right. So let me have a look at my very last item, which is the license manager. This is set up. Okay, so I'm going to let uh, Lisa just sent through. Can I rearrange the accounts at uh, the order of the accounts line by line? Lisa, that's an excellent question, and the answer is very sim is actually very simple. Remember that all of the reports that you create, everything that comes through comes through into an Excel file. It's an Excel sheet. You can do whatever you like to it. So if you want to cut lines, insert lines, paste them, insert your own columns, you can simply cut any of the account lines and rearrange them so you can start creating your own groupings if you like to. That's entirely up to you. The main thing is that when you start reorganizing those things, you create and link your template so those changes will stay. All right. uh, Tammy sent through, did I send out the course material today? Tammy, I did indeed, but it uh, seems like you, you didn't get it, so I'll make sure that I send it through to you again at the end of the presentation. All right, so final point, guys. Oh, and I use guys as a generic term, I please apologize if anybody took offense. Okay, so on your screen now you'll be seeing the license manager. Okay, this is where you can start adding particular licenses to particular machines. We'll talk about the connector module later. We'll also talk about uh, the Excel, uh, the financial report, the Excel Genie report later as well, but you can change who is licensed to see what. Access to the connector module should be limited. It should only be given to people who have a good understanding of the table structures of Peachtree or who have very good SQL knowledge. The reason being is when you go into the connector module, you can start sampling tables and seeing what information is stored throughout the system. You obviously don't want certain people having access to that because if they create maybe a container looking at customers sales for particular periods, but they have no right to be seeing that information, Connect the module will actually give them access to that. So you should be very, very careful as far as the Connect the module license and who gets access to it. Now, when we talk about the connector in more detail later, I'll go through who should, as in which customers should get the container and which ones shouldn't. Not all customers need it, but there are some very specific criteria as to why they might need to have it. And we'll be covering those at a later session. So in the license manager, you're able to add licenses to a particular machine, which say which access, which modular access this particular uses on this particular machine. All right. So that's highlighting and you'll be able to review the video to see where I got to that. It was from my reports and forms from my business intelligence setup and I can select the report, uh, sorry, the license manager there. But again, reviewing the video you'll be able to see exactly which keystrokes I took in real time. Okay, what more are we doing as far as level two is concerned? So we've just, I apologize that we've run a couple of minutes over time, I really do. What's to come in level two? Well, we're gonna take you a bit further as far as report creation processes are concerned. We're going to take a look at container, and connect the functionality, what happens over that side, how we can start using these reports in a consolidated way. We're also gonna take a look at dashboard information, how you can start creating dashboard reports. What I mean by a dashboard report, the question was asked earlier, what is a union report? A union report runs multiple reports into the one workbook. So I can run a sales report and a stock report and a purchases report all on different sheets in my Excel workbook, but then I can create a brand new sheet at the end with graphs from each of those sub-reports. That's a dashboard report. So those are the items that we're gonna be uh, gonna start taking you into as far as 11, uh, level two is concerned. 
So let me just answer the last couple of last questions. Lisa, is access to the license manager controlled by Peachtree user security? Yes, it is. And Jane, when will we receive the video referred to this week and last? Well, last week's video is already available. Let me move through last couple of slides here, Jane, and then I'll give you the link to show you exactly uh, where you can find those particular videos. Scott said, is there a list of what all the buttons in the do in the advanced options? There is indeed a list, Scott. We can make it available for you, but we'll be doing that as part of the sessions. We'll be going through the advanced options and showing you what they actually do. All right. Future webcasts, 30th of March, 6th of April. Then there's a break because I will be out of the country. 20th of April, uh, we'll be completing Level 2, Session 3. So it's the final session of the Level 2 courses where we're talking, taking a look at more advanced report writing functions and things that we can do. All right. Now, here is the updated link. Uh, Jennifer, I note that you didn't get the exercises, etc. I will make sure they get sent to you, not a problem. Okay. Uh, Tammy's found her course material. Excellent. Sorry, yeah, it seems like there might have been a bit of delay there on the email, Tammy. The, the link that is on your screen right now, that is the actual page with last week's session links, okay? So the videos, the video of that particular session, and it's also the page that you'll go to to download today's session. It'll be uploaded inside of the next 24 hours. We'll send you out the specific link to let you know exactly where it is, but if you take down those details, let me close up my GoToWebinar so you can actually see that screen properly. Community.alchemax.com forward slash group forward slash Peachtree Business Intelligence. Mark, from right at the start of the session, uh, Mark, that's the link that you need to download last week's session. All right. Guys, I do apologize. Again, guys, please bear with me. I do apologize that we ran slightly over time. There was a lot for me to get through, but all of it is covered in the documentation that your friendly Peachtree training staff have put together, which is, makes my job a heck of a lot easier, and I really do thank them for that. All of the documentation covers everything that I demonstrated in this particular presentation, so you won't be missing out on anything at all. all right. Um, I will stick around for another five minutes. Um, if there are any other questions that come through, but it looks like everybody's heading off, so that's fine. It, it lets me head off as well. Um, sorry, we don't see the link from last week at this site. Right, let me... bring up a community.alchemex.com and Isaac, I will show you exactly where the link is. It's in groups. Your screen will be updating in just a few moments. HTTP Tree Business Intelligence. There we go. Okay. All right. So when your screen updates, you'll now be looking at the Sage Peachtree Business Intelligence link from our BI community. A um, couple of happy smiling faces. Mine is not amongst them. Sorry. Uh, but Ruth Gray, uh, you may actually be hearing from her in some other presentations during this training course. There's the site, Sage Peachtree Business Intelligence. There's the welcome video. It's actually, I'm highlighting it there, Sage Peachtree Business Intelligence, basic and advanced. That's the recorded training uh, events. You can go there and download the video. Is there any documentation I can get to start on and to get an advance start on advance? I think Scott. Well, I can give everybody the um, this information. If you would like to play, and you know what, I encourage it. I have absolutely no problems with people going in, getting their their fingers dirty, getting their uh, nails dirty, etc. Scott the help file. If you have a look at the help file, the help file is actually the documentation of all of the functionalities themselves. Okay, So if you had a look at any of the advanced options through the help file, it'll start showing you exactly what each of those particular options can do. If you have any particular questions, what I would suggest, Scott, is to come back to this particular web page, the, uh, the BI community, and what I would suggest is, I'm highlighting it now for you, to go to the forum area, have a look at all categories, okay, because there will be 
a Peachtree Business Intelligence category where you can post that particular question. There's forums for all of the integrations that we've done. So we're happy to go in and post any particular questions. I really don't have a problem to in, uh, in you getting a jump start. Absolutely not. Okay. Tammy sent through the question saying, uh, it doesn't show the welcome video, etc. It actually says you need to become a member. Tell me how to become a, to get approved for the group. Actually, Tammy, you're, what you're talking about over here on the right hand side, I'm going to sign out from here. You actually need to become a member of the community, but once that's done, okay, you can then download any of the content that's available. So actually, probably, uh, I think it's more referring to becoming a member of the BI community site. From the main community homepage, you'll have the sign up option over here on the right hand side. I'm just hovering my mouse. Let me just highlight it for you. Top right hand corner of the homepage, you can sign up there. Once you're signed up as a member of the community, you can then choose to follow and join any particular group. The membership shouldn't be restricted. Okay, so Tammy, you should be fine for that. Okay, it says, at least, uh, it says members must be approved. All right, I'm gonna check with our people, make sure that, you've, that you are approved. I don't know why you shouldn't be. Lisa, we like you. There's no particular reason why we shouldn't. Okay, uh, so we'll make sure that you do get any approval that you need. All right. All right, Frederick. Uh, Frederick, I'm going to resend those attachments to you because it looks like uh, everybody else that got them, Frederick, um, is able to open them. Okay. All right, Frederick, I'll resend. Actually, Frederick, I need you to send me through your email address again because I keep getting messages that uh, your email address, something's happening there. So, Frederick, can you just send through your email address? Uh, give me two. Give me an alternate email address so I can make sure it gets through to you. Okay, that's the one I've got, Frederick, the one you sent through. Send me through another one so I can make sure I definitely get it to you. Diane, all right, let's go back and I'll show you exactly where the videos are, Diane. Thanks very much, Frederick. All right, uh, Diane, screens are going to be updating. Oh, helps if I sign in. Okay, actually, that might be the point. Diane, okay, I'm going to let my screen update right now. Okay, so your screen's updating now. I have presently signed out of my account on the community, okay? Because of that, I have no information here. Diane, is that what you're looking at on the screen? Now I just have to wait for Diane to send me a yes or a no. Uh, Diane, if that's what you're looking at on the screen, then it means you need to sign into the community itself. And you can do that top right-hand corner. You'll be able to see the welcome to and sign up option. Once you're there, once you've signed in, you see exactly the same screen. All right, so Diane, let me, I'll, Take it offline, I'll see why you're not getting access, and we'll make sure that's updated for you. All right, no problems at all. Quite welcome, Diane. All right, guys, it's now almost quarter past the hour. I have kept you much longer than I intended to. I do apologize for that, but I hope you found value in what, uh, what we've provided. You can now use this video when you have access to it, when the link is up, to download and review it against the documentation that's already been sent through to you. Uh, if you haven't got the documentation, please let us know. We'll make sure we get it to you. All right. So, guys, thank you again with the guys, non-generic people. Thank you very much for taking time out. Appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, which will be next week, 30th of March. All right. Till then, please keep safe. I'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks very much.